Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Hello. We'll give uh, everyone a moment to get their audio all set up okay, get connected in, but we're really glad that you're here. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome. It's uh, it's good to see you all. All right. Seems like we might have a quorum of votes, so I think we'll maybe go ahead and get started. So, uh, welcome to this faculty office hour session for chemistry, biochemistry, and molecular biology. We're really glad that you're here with us today. My name is Grant Sewell. I use he/him pronouns. I'm an associate dean of admission, and I'm going to be kind of guiding us through our conversation. Um, you know, and we're joined by one of our esteemed faculty members, and maybe I'll allow them to provide us with a brief introduction to start. Hi, everybody. It's good to see all of you. Uh, my name is Shivani Ahuja. I am a faculty in the chemistry department, and I also am a biochemist. So we also have our interdisciplinary BMB major, which is biochemistry and molecular biology. I'm happy to answer any questions you have today. Um, I use she and her pronouns. And let's see, I've been here for about four years. This is my second year as tenure track faculty. I started at Reed as a visiting faculty and I teach um, a number of different courses because my background is very interdisciplinary in its nature, which actually is one of the strengths of the uh, Reed program is that there's a lot of interdisciplinary work that goes on here. So I'm a physicist by training, but then I'm moved completely into biochemistry. So I teach both physical chemistry courses and biochemistry courses, including introduction to chemistry at Reed. So happy to answer any questions you have. Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, you know, as Shivani said, we're, we're definitely very interested in, you know, speaking to the, the questions that are on your mind and that you're interested to kind of ask of us. And, you know, I would imagine most people are pretty familiar with the Zoom chat feature, you know, by, by this time. But um, I would say that's probably going to be the best way to ask the questions that you're kind of curious to know. You can either message that to everyone or you can message it, you know, to myself and we'll kind of make sure that we, you know, speak to things that are on your mind. But kind of first, just to kind of give us a framing about um, some of the different areas that, you know, Shivani's a part of, maybe we'll just kind of start with an overview. So we'll turn it back over to you. Okay, great. So um, uh, let's see. So for the, uh, in the chemistry, I guess, um, so let's see, for the chemistry department and for the chemistry major, we have, um, should I talk about the major planning? What would you like me to focus on for the department? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think, you know, the major planning is, is super helpful. I know sometimes students are also curious to know what it might look like as a, as a student in the department or in their sure. first year. So just, yeah, anything you think might be helpful to know. Sure. So, okay. Um, we are a department of about um, 7.5 faculty. It's I know the numbering sounds weird. We are, the faculty are involved in different areas of research. And um, so we have biochemist, organic chemist, physical chemist, inorganic chemist, and um, and more recently, education research in chemistry, which is a new. So we have a new faculty who started last year in tenure track position, and uh, the she does uh, education research, which is something very new for the chemistry department, and it's really exciting. Um, as a first year, when you are starting at Reed and you're interested or thinking about a chemistry major, we often have students, uh, we encourage them to enroll in the introduction to chemistry courses, which are essentially um, an extension of AP chemistry. If you have, if any of you have taken high school chemistry courses, they're an extension of that where you're introduced to uh, almost every subdiscipline of chemistry over a period of an entire year, which is two semesters. So it's a two semester long course, uh, though they're not uh, um, taught by the same faculty. And they also are treated as two separate courses, but you can you have to take them in that order. So the Chem 101 and Chem 102, which are our introduction to chemistry courses or general chemistry curriculum. It's an intense curriculum. There is a lot that gets covered in those two semesters, but it kind of gives an idea to the students of the breadth of chemistry that goes on at Reed and in just general, the different subdisciplines of chemistry. 
it's also a laboratory slash lecture course. So students are also involved in laboratory experiments in both the semesters. They get to um, also do independent projects at the end where they get a little flavor of what it is like to do research in addition to being involved in predefined laboratory experiments. It's a pretty fun course. Uh, so I am actually part of that intro curriculum as well. And then um, depending, and then we also have another intro course that almost every chemistry student and biochemistry and molecular biology students are uh, required to do, which is our introduction to organic chemistry. And that's again, a one year long sequence. Um, you have to do the two courses, one after the other, but they're taught by different faculty. And it also gives them an idea of what all is there in organic chemistry. And these two courses are kind of prerequisites for most of our advanced level courses in the department. Chemistry offers a variety of advanced level courses. What you'll end up doing would in the end depend upon what major that you decide to do, like if it's a pure chemistry major or a BMB major, or if you decide to change over and do biology or neurosciences, there, are, there is a breadth of courses available to the students. And they, like I said earlier, they cover many different fields of chemistry, just like the different faculty in the department, which is inorganic, physical, um, biochemistry, um, statistical mechanics and thermodynamics and education research. Actually, we do not yet have a course that we teach on education research. Um, I wanna give you an opportunity to ask questions also. So feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions in the middle about any of the curriculum stuff, but I would love to tell you a little bit about the thesis at Reed, uh, unless you're already aware of it, which is a very exciting thing. And also the fact that there's a lot of research that goes on here during summer, as well as during the semester. Maybe I'll take a break here and see if you have any questions. There was one question that I got, which I think you touched on a little bit, but um, I think students were just kind of curious if there was any active research that like either you're a part of or the students are participating in that's uh, currently happening within the chemistry department. Yeah. Um... Uh, the, one of the great things about Reed is the research. The research at Reed is really, really strong. And so almost every, or not almost, every department, every faculty member has their own little research program. So we all have our independent research labs. Uh, the college actually um, provides very decent funding for us to carry out our independent research. Plus we all also apply for external funding that helps us um, maintain and run those research programs. And it's all driven by undergraduates. In the chemistry department, um, now we are starting to see faculty trying to um, hire postdocs, but it's very far in between. Most of our work is driven by our undergraduate students, which is amazing. So, it's, um, so there are multiple students who work in each lab. For example, I have my own uh, research lab. I look at, I work on um, looking at structures of proteins in our body or in other animals, particularly uh, bacteria. And I try to solve, uh, understand what do they look like when you go down to the atomic level? What does the structure look like? And what kind of function these proteins are involved in? And I use a variety of biophysical techniques to look at the structures. There are three big techniques out in the field. And the undergraduate students actually get to do all three of them at Reed. Like a lot of these techniques are um, so I'm just going to throw out the names there, and I'm happy to elaborate on them, but there's nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy on in short NMR, which is very similar to MRI, if you have heard of MRI imaging, but it's, think of it as looking at smaller molecules, then looking at somebody's brain or body parts. You try to look at the structure of the proteins using a very similar technique. There's also X-ray crystallography, where we've tried to change our proteins into tiny, tiny, beautiful crystals, and then solve the structure of the lattices that are created by these proteins. And more recently, one of the cutting edge technologies is a microscopy technique, which instead of using light, like microscopes use light to look at things, right, in magnification, instead of light, you can use a beam of electrons, and that's called electron microscopy. So that's a very new and it has a, it's an it's a very amazing technique and it's mostly accessible at um, big universities and industry, but at Reed our students do electron microscopy on many different kinds, 
and um, they get to collect their own data. They get to process, analyze, and get a flavor of what it's like to do research at an R1 university before you ever have to decide, is PhD or graduate school for me or not? And that's not just for me. My research program is just one of the seven different research programs in the chemistry department, and everybody does something different. For example, we have a lot of synthetic organic chemistry work that happens. Like I mentioned, this education research, that's one another research program. Then we have um, physical chemistry, which is uh, like laser spectroscopy kind of work. We have another biochemist who looks at uh, different kinds of proteins and looks at metals in biology. What roles do metal ions play? Hmm, let me see if I'm forgetting anybody. We also have analytical chemistry. So looking at what are the pollutants in the nearby water bodies, right? So the students go collect samples and uh, they use many different analytical techniques like mass, spectro like mass spectroscopy, gas chromatography, um, plasma and mass spectroscopy to identify at very quantitatively what are the different things present in our water and soil and then try to further understand how it has changed over the past few years and then make models to see how um, pollution from different sources is affecting the quality of our water and soil. So those are just some examples of the kind of research that goes on in our department. I see that there's a question in the chat. For a second. Yeah, um, it looks like we had a question that was, um, how competitive is securing a spot in the research labs? Is it something you have to begin very early on in the school year or how does that work? No, if you don't have to begin, uh, honestly, we encourage everybody to apply. Um, so the way it works is during the semester, it's really hard for students to be in, involved in research because there's so much coursework, especially if you're coming in as a first year, you have so many introductory courses to be think about and also the group requirements, right? This is a holistic education environment where you are encouraged to, of course, do your, you have to do your major requirements, but in addition, you're required to do a lot of group requirements, which exposes you to many fields outside your area of major interest. And I can talk more about that. So often the first year, it becomes really difficult for students to even find time to do research. When it really starts is the first summer. So every department on campus, and uh, which, uh, but I can say definitely for chemistry, we have a lot of uh, endowed funds and our own departmental funding that funds, I would say approximately somewhere between 20 to 30 research positions during the summer. These are internships, they are 10 week programs, fully paid. Uh, you get a really nice um, um, fellowship. And it's also very prestigious because you can put that on your resume. And um, so we have some of the fellowship money that also comes with money for on-campus housing. So we have different pool spots of money that we use to fund um, our summer interns. And there we encourage all um, different years at read, right? So first, second, third year students to apply. And it's um, in the past years, honestly, we have never turned away a student because we always got around 20 to 24 applications and we always were able to find money to hire all the students. This year has been a especially interesting year. We got 54 applications, right? That's a lot. And, uh, uh, and it was incredible to see our first years also really interested in working in the department. Um, unfortunately, we only had money to um, take on 34 students, which is also a huge number in the past. We have never been able to go beyond 20 to 24. So we have about 34 students working in the department and the numbers change every year, right? So you apply and um, a lot of the times students get the positions in case, like for this year, for example, we had to turn away some of the students. We could not take everybody on. I, I wish we could have hired everyone, but we just could not. And then the way it works is the following year, the students are encouraged to apply again. And if they have applied the prior year and for any reason they could not get the position, then they get first preference. Like they are basically, if they are, their application is considered before the rest of the pool, just so that everybody gets an opportunity to work in the department. And um, so students often work one or two summers before they reach their senior year, which is when you have the thesis. Do you all know about the thesis at Reed? Yes, I see a few nods, wonderful. Yeah, I, I think that's also something that kind of sets Reed apart from a lot of other smaller colleges is the, uh, the idea of a required thesis, 
right? Which actually is amazing, right? So you you get not only get to do research, but you also get credit for it. So it's equivalent to like a two unit course, right? And so you do it's over the two semesters, and a lot of students. Um, they start summer research and they often either stay in the same lab or you may change labs and do your thesis research in a completely different lab. And um, that is an amazing program because every student at Reed gets to participate in their in independent research with a faculty. Sometimes students can come up with their own ideas and depending on the bandwidth of the faculty, they either may be able to support independent projects. Sometimes you do the projects that are in line with the faculty's own research work. And um, you get to do research along with your courses for an entire year. And then you get to write a thesis document, which is bound. And then it's a very formal process where we also go through a defense, just like graduate defense, where you have to um, pick a committee. So you have your thesis advisor, somebody from your department, somebody from outside the department, but in the same division, somebody from outside the division. So you have at least have four members of the faculty across the college who gets to come and then talk to you about your thesis, which is the orals examination that happens at the end of your senior year. And it's closed doors, very formal. It's essentially a conversation between the faculty and the student where the student tells us about what they did. So there are many ways in which you can um, be involved in research. Like I said, you have the thesis, you have the summer research. In addition to that, we have what are called independent research projects, which is during the semester, if you want to continue uh, to be involved in research or would like to get some research experience, you can work with the faculty to write up a proposal for an independent research project, which is actually a course. So it's a half a unit course and you do get credit for it. You have to write up a proposal. The proposal gets submitted to the department and the division. And once it's approved, that becomes part of your transcript, right? As a course for 0.5 units that you are involved in during a semester. And I think you can do, okay, I'm not sure about exactly how many, I think you can do up to two or something like that, independent uh, uh, projects where you get units for it. Now, in addition to that, you could be in, involved in research during a semester, which is uh, depending on the department, right? Some department, it happens all the time. Some department, it's just the nature of the coursework and the course load and the research is such that the students may not be fully involved. But you could work in a lab. And if you work in the lab in a department, especially, and I can only talk for chemistry. I'm not sure how it works in other departments. You get paid as well. You get hourly paid for your work in that department. So that if you can take out two hours, three hours, in addition to your course load, you can always reach out to the faculty and say, hey, I'm really interested. I've never worked in a lab before, or I worked before and I really had a good time, or I would like to get more experience. And you could work in a lab during the semester. It just sometimes becomes really hard with all the other responsibilities that come with being a major at Reed or doing a major at Reed. I think the oh, there might be another question coming in as well, but I think there was also just kind of a curiosity question just about like what the intersection with like biology, you know, biochemistry yeah. might look like. So I don't know if you maybe want to touch on that and then perhaps yes. molecular biology. Yeah, absolutely. I can talk about that too. Um, so um, I have a question in the chat that says, have you found that students that have taken AP chemistry have a hard transition into chemistry? I would say it's the reverse. If you have taken AP chemistry, you may already have been exposed to some of the concepts that we start to cover, that we cover during introduction to chemistry, right? So it may actually, uh, or haven't, I'm sorry, I read the question wrong, haven't. No, I, uh, okay, there are two, yes, let me see. I think, okay, I'll tell you um, the way chemistry department thinks about the introduction to chemistry courses. We don't assume that a student has taken AP chemistry. The reason being, the introduction to chemistry curriculum is um, something that is for every student on campus, whether they are interested in being a chemistry major or they're trying to take introduction chemistry just to satisfy one of their group requirements, right? And they are actually interested in say, a major in theater or arts or languages. 
so we cannot assume that a student has taken AP chemistry. So when the chemistry curriculum is introduced, it starts from scratch and then builds up from there. However, what we have noticed is that students who have taken AP chemistry, because they have seen a lot of these concepts before, are more comfortable sometimes in class. And for others, initially that may make them, oh, it's something so new. And that's the discomfort I'm talking about, that it is just the fact that it's something new, but not because it is assumed here at all that you have taken AP chemistry. That's absolutely not the case. I don't know if that answers your question. However, if you are um, uh, if you're if you are asking about the amount of math, I think that is one where I see um, the discomfort come up is the way our intercurriculum is set up. Our first semester is very conceptual, and we're trying to build all those fundamentals of chemistry. And our second semester, which actually what I teach is extremely math heavy because you start to now apply mathematical models to chemistry problems and trying to under and then building on. And so there, um, students who have seen that material before feel a little bit more comfortable or similar material. I won't say it's identical because it builds on top of AP. However, um, what happens by then is that a lot of you would have taken introduction to mathematics courses, and that will also help you get more comfortable by the time we reach um, 102. In addition to that, the faculty in 102 is really aware of the fact that we have students from all over the campus. And so we help build that mathematical understanding and fundamentals as we are teaching them. There's a lot of support in terms of tutoring, and I'm happy to ex uh, expand on that, especially for our intro courses. We have drop-in tutoring, one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Uh, faculty offers tons of office hours so that we can help all students be able to fully engage with the course and not be influenced by whether they had before AP or not. Um, how heavy would you say that the coursework in chemistry and BMB biology programs is manageable? Do your students have time to do other activities as well? That's a great question. Maybe I'll start off with telling you a little bit about the BMB program and then move into this question from Kerry. Okay, so um, um, in the chemistry department, I mean, there are multiple, I mean, there are different majors that are accessible to the students. You can, of course, be a pure chemistry major. And then we have interdisciplinary majors like environmental sciences and chemistry, that's chem ES major, and then BMB, which is biochemistry and molecular biology. And these interdisciplinary majors are constructed in collaboration with the other departments. So for example, BMB is chemistry and biology departments that work together to create that interdisciplinary major. And then chemistry and environmental sciences works with the environmental sciences program to create this major. And, um, in the interdisciplinary majors are definitely have more number of major requirements than say a pure chemistry major. So in that sense, they are a little uh, more time consuming because the major requirements are more in number. Um, so the way it, it is done is you, the way it's designed is that you do certain number of biology courses and certain number of chemistry courses so that and, and the way we do it is that you have to do all the intro chemistry because that forms the fundamentals of any advanced level courses. And similarly, you do introduction to biology that forms the fundamental, uh, provides the fundamentals for all the advanced biology courses. And then you have to select, and then you have like eight to 10 courses from the biology department from where you have to select about three. And then from the chemistry department, you have defined courses that you have to take, which includes your biochemistry series which is taught in the chemistry department along with laboratory um, attached with those courses. And the same is true for biology. Most of the biology courses that you'll take will have labs associated with them. One thing that does make the BMB major, um, I would say it's definitely manageable, just to answer your question, it's definitely manageable. The, the, the Problem comes when a student decides that they want to do a BMB major at the end of their sophomore year. I think that's when it becomes a little tricky. Not that it doesn't happen. It just means that your junior and senior year would be a little bit more intense because you have to pack more courses into it. When you come in and you kind of have an idea that I might be interested in BMB or chemistry, your academic advisors will work with you to make sure that you are doing all the intro courses that are kind of preparing you for whichever direction you decide to go. 
the problem happens when say a student has not done those intro courses and then would like to move over into a BMB major, then they have to spend an additional year kind of finishing the courses and then pack all the uh, advanced level courses in their end of junior and senior year that does become intense. I've had students who have done that, but they have been very successful, still had a great time, but it was very hectic for them because rather than taking then three, three courses, which is the six unit minimum thesis year requirement, they may end up taking four courses in each semester, which does mean more work than usual or like the more work than how we advise our students. We always advise them that, you know, try to keep your senior year a little light so that you can truly enjoy the thesis experience, right? But when you end up with a lot of courses in your thesis year or your senior year, then it does make it very hectic for those students. Let's see if I have, oh, and one thing I wanna say about the interdisciplinary programs is we have something at Reed called the qualifying examinations. Have you heard of the quals or the qualifying examinations? I see a few nods, a thumbs up. Okay, if you haven't, that's fine. I can explain that to you. So essentially, what uh, defines you as a senior at Reed is once you have passed what we call as qualifying examinations, but at the end of your junior year. So at the end of your sophomore year, you declare your major and you move into your junior year where you start taking some of the advanced level courses in your field of major, right? In the field that you're gonna be majoring in. And then at the end of your junior year, you have to take a qualifying exam. Again, the nature of the qualifying exam changes from department to department. And I can talk about the one from chemistry and the biology department. And once you clear the qualifying examination, you are ready to do thesis, right? So this is a way to make sure that our students understand the requirements of a thesis, right? What they are getting. So basically to be make sure that they will have a great time and making sure they're ready for that experience. And once they pass the qualifying examination, you're considered a senior in the college and then you start your thesis process. That's a requirement. Um, you get multiple chance, chances to pass your qualifying examination. Um, and for interdisciplinary majors, you have to take two qualifying examination. That's that's one. That's I think what makes this these interdisciplinary majors a little harder for the students is because if you are a BMB major, you have to pass the qualifying examination both from the chemistry department and the biology department. But you don't have to do two theses, right? You still do one thesis, and you can decide whether you want to do your thesis in the biology or the chemistry department. That's totally up to you. Depends upon where you like the research more, whom did you enjoy working with or taking a course with, or were excited to hear about their program. You only do one thesis, but you have to do two qualifying examinations. Okay, let's see if I answered that question. How heavy would you say the coursework in chemistry and or BMB uh, programs is manageable? It's really manageable. That much I can tell you. Again, planning is really important. And the entire um, burden of that does not fall on your shoulders. From the very first day, even before you join Reed, you are assigned academic advisors. And these advisors are really well aware of the programs that you have shown interest in. And even if, say, you come in, uh, for example, I have uh, advisees who came in to Reed wanting to do Chem ES major and halfway through decided that they really enjoyed their biochemistry sequence and want to do BMB major, if the advisor is not um, comfortable advising them anymore because the major has completely changed, they will tell you, please go talk to this person, let's figure out your major plan, and then maybe you should shift over to them. So at Reed, academic advising is taken extremely seriously, so you never have to figure any of this out alone and your academic advisors can absolutely help you navigate that entire um, system. Do your students have time to do other activities as well? I really hope so. I mean, that's the idea we do have. I really hope my students are doing way more than just their coursework and uh, lab work. I think it is so important. Chemistry department, um, believes very strongly in, in forming a community. That is so important to us. And uh, outside the courses, we as a department also organize a series of events for our students and opportunities for them to get to know each other through the semester. But more importantly, even during summer, like our summer cohort of students, we do a lot of stuff with them 
we definitely try to do things in the beginning. And I'm, I know for a fact that biology does it too. I think it is so important to form a community outside of your classroom. But even beyond that, right, the college does a lot in making sure that students have opportunities to get to know one another, get to really enjoy college life outside of your classroom. Um, have you heard of PE at Reed? It's a requirement, six quarters of PE, which I can guarantee you, students come in thinking, I have a lot of time. And then they keep postponing as an academic advisor. The first thing I tell them is there is no postponing of PE because there are many advantages, right? You uh, curriculum at Reed is intense and it is stressful. And um, of course you have your instructors, your academic advisors, your tutors, the, the entire disability and accessibility resources and support. There's a ton of support, but you still need something to just decompress and to do something else than studies. And that's where PE comes in. In addition to, of course, the clubs and some of the other uh, activities, PE is a way for you to engage in, um, something that can help you de-stress. There are so many options available. I wish I had time to take some of those, but I don't juggling, right? And uh, uh, juggling, uh, rock climbing, hiking, running, you name it, there are tons, meditation, yoga, there are many, many options. And we almost force, not almost, we force our students to do it because we feel like sometimes they forget that they have to take care of themselves as well. And um, so P is very important. So I really hope my students are doing way more than just coming to class. Um, there's a recommended first year schedule for the chemistry major on the department's website. Is there a recommended schedule for biochem and does it differ from chemistry? Yes, and not so much. Okay, so yes, we do have what are called um, first year planners for all majors. And I'm assuming you, uh, as you decide whether you're coming to, I'm not sure if the decisions have been made or not, or, but anyway, you mean, before you start at Reed, you are, uh, you'll meet your academic advisors and they will share those um, planners with you, even if they're not online, ideally they should be. Uh, however, for a chemistry or a BMB major, the first year looks pretty much the same. You do your introduction to chemistry course, you are encouraged to enroll in bio, in uh, intro chemistry, uh, introduction to biology courses. And then there is a, um, humanities course called Hume 110, which is required by every student on campus, right? That's a requirement for everybody. It's again, a one year long sequence um, and it's actually three units. So it's almost equivalent to three full courses. And uh, um, typically every incoming student is enrolled in Hume 110. And then if you're a chemistry major or a BMB, you will take Chem 101 and if you are interested in BMB even a little bit, you are encouraged to take Bio 101, which is your biology course. Otherwise, a lot of chemistry students take an, any math requirement in the beginning or maybe a group requirement, but we encourage them to take the math course because these all form prerequisites for many of the advanced level courses. More questions. I think there was, I think there was a question just because you, you touched on, you know, the opportunity of the thesis, which was, Really great to hear, but I think students are also curious to know if there's any, um, you know, memorable thesis works or any ones that you're currently advising, just kind of ones that you've seen come come your way. Um, I can tell you this one thing. I am always blown away by the students at Reed. I've been here for four years and I really cannot pick one. Um, so I went through a very traditional track, right? In the sense that I did my undergrad, did my um, graduation, PhD, postdoc, and then you apply for faculty positions. And when you are in that research environment, you get to know a lot of other researchers, right? So a lot of us are in these faculty positions. And I talk a lot to people at R1 universities, at OHSU nearby, I collaborate a lot with them. And one thing that they're always amazed by is how uh, driven and motivated Reed students are. Because when you come to Reed, a lot of times you are attracted by the strength of research that goes on here. And by the time you come to your fourth year, you are really excited about the fact that you get to be involved and be a part of some really incredible independent research that you are driving. And so I can honestly tell you, I cannot pick. I have had amazing thesis students. Like I've had, I'm, I always, I'm amazed by them. One of my, um, um, 
friends at OHSU, who is also a faculty there, uh, we often talk about this. He'll tell me, Shivani, how do I motivate my grad students? I mean, it's not that they're not motivated, but PhD is a long haul. It's a marathon. What you're doing at Reed is kind of like a sprint. So you come in geared up and you just keep going till you reach the finish line. But PhD is a marathon. So students slow down. There are ups and downs. And my friend would always ask me, how do you motivate your students to be in the lab? And to, I'm like, I never have to do anything. I, in fact, have to tell them you need to take a break. Maybe you should take the winter time break off and take two weeks off because you need to come back, finish your thesis, finish your courses. You need some time off. I honestly, I'm telling you, I've never had to worry about my students' motivation and how much they enjoy research at Reed. I hope that answers your question. Let's see, there's another question. Um, in the first year schedule, would there be space to take other classes as well, for example, if a BMB major wanted to take an intro to physics course. Absolutely. First of all, let me tell you, introduction to physics is required for a BMB major. It is one of your requirements. And a lot of um, BMB majors, which I wish they wouldn't, sometimes do postpone introduction, introduction to physics. So our introductory physics courses, which is physics 101 and 102 series, again, a year-long course. Um, sometimes to their sophomore year and junior year, which I almost wish they wouldn't. And so you absolutely can. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit. As an academic advisor, I tell my students not to take more than three to 3.5 units, which is three to three and a half courses. Well, Hume alone is one and a half, right? In your first semester. That doesn't mean you cannot take more. You can, you can enroll up to 4.5 units without overloading. So you can absolutely enroll in Introduction to Physics, which is a one unit course per semester. The reason we tell our students not to do that or we'll advise them not to do that is you're coming excited about college. That absolutely is great, but still it's an extremely new environment, right? It takes time to adjust to a new environment, to get used to. Um, the culture here, get to know people, you are starting a whole new career. We don't even realize it, but sometimes it can be a lot of a lot more stressful than we realize. And so we we often advise our students to start with three to three and a half units per semester in the first year. However, I have had lots of advisees who would start with four and a half, and I don't stop them. You absolutely should do what you want. But also remember, there's always an opportunity to drop a course, right? So say you come in and you're like, okay, I want to do chem, I want to do bio, I want to do physics. I want to take these three courses with you. You're looking at four and a half units. You start, you have two weeks of add and drop. Then you have six weeks to drop a course. During that six weeks, you will get to know from your instructor how you're doing in the course. If you're able to manage this kind of course load in addition to adjusting to read and you know, starting your career at a college. And if you feel like it's too much, you can always drop a course and it's absolutely fine as long as it's within the first six weeks. And again, this is where academic advisors come in. We constantly are in touch with you through your first year. At REITS, there is this concept of four week comments. So at four weeks into your first semester at REIT, and it's true for every semester, but just so important for the first semester, the advisors check in with all their first years, the instructors put in comments, and let the advisors know how the students are doing. That really helps us in having those conversations with you to make sure you are able to manage that course load in your first year at Reed. How many pre-med students have ended up taking chem BMB major route for a major? Many, I don't have numbers, honestly, um, but a lot of pre-med students do BMB major. Some will do chemistry, but you don't need to. That's a really important thing to remember. If you are a pre-med, you, you can do a, little bit less intense uh, major if you want. You don't have to do a BMB major. You could be a lit lang major, right? That's absolutely not a requirement, but many pre-meds do end up taking BMB. However, if you need numbers, I'll have to refer you to somebody else. I'm not sure about the exact numbers. Um, you are most welcome, Martin. Yeah, and I, I was thinking there was a question because you kind of touched on the, you know, the strong relationships students have with their advisor and kind of making sure they're picking a, a schedule that's manageable, but also like receiving feedback. And so kind of thinking about Reed's approach to grades and oh feedback, how do, you, yes. how do you see students can, adjusting to that? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I can talk about grading a lot. Okay. I feel very strongly about grading. So, um, so, um, 
Do you know that at Reed students, I'm gonna start with a sentence which you may already be aware of, don't get to see their grades on their transcripts. Did you know that? Yes, okay, I see some nods, great. Yes, so at Reed we have, um, we are encouraged to de-emphasize grades. I can tell you um, when I first started here and I was doing my first set of grading and getting the grades together for after the first semester and I realized students never see anything other than pass or fail unless they have a grade of C minus and lower. And that just threw me, I'm like, I am not used to that. My entire life I have been told, this is your grade, here is where you stand, you got 70% out of 100 or you got, 80% or you got a grade of A or a B or a C. I felt like that's what told me where I stand in a course. And I have realized that that is so not the case, right? At Reed, the way we, um, what's important to us is that our students are understanding the concepts that they are being taught in the classroom, right? We have just been very conditioned to say, if I got an eight out of 10, this is what it means. What we are trying to do at Reed is break you out of that thinking to realize that you will be given concrete comments by your instructors that's gonna tell you exactly how well you are engaging with the course, which is way more important than having a number that's defining how you're doing in the course. So what happens is when you submit a problem set as an assignment or you take an exam, we grade it, right? We go over the entire exam, we give you detailed comments on what was done well, where you could have done better, where are some of the uh, concepts that are lacking, or if you did absolutely fantastic and we think you should move on to the next uh, thing, we will say that to you very clearly on your problem set, but you will not see a grade from us. And that can be really disconcerting, but that also doesn't mean I'm not keeping my own grade sheet. I have my joint Excel sheets. I do my own grading, but I don't share the number grade or the letter grade with my students. But I can completely understand. It's you then you feel like this, uh, um, these comments, are they telling me enough? So what happens is at around four weeks, uh, faculty are required to give comments for students whom they feel are having trouble in the course or having trouble adjusting to the course or are not doing as well. We also give comments to students who are doing great. We also let them know you're doing fine, nothing to worry about, here are your strengths, here is what you should focus on. That happens at four weeks. When those comments come out, they are accessible to you and your academic advisor. At that point, you meet with your advisor, if it seems like you need additional help, the instructor would have laid out a plan in their comments. They would have said, I would strongly encourage you to come to my office hours or go meet up with the tutors. Tutoring is really big at Reed. I want to really say that here, that somehow students come with this idea that there's a stigma attached to tutoring, that if you reach out for help, it means you're not doing well. I can tell you my most my strongest students go more often to tutoring than others. And I wish all students would take advantage of tutors because tutors are the students who have just taken the course before you. They have gone through the whole thing. They probably understand and can sometimes explain, actually many times can explain concepts in a way that might be even more accessible to you than how an instructor would explain. So we strongly encourage students to go for tutoring and to come to us, of course. But sometimes I can understand students are more comfortable going in groups. So we have drop-in tutoring hours where students are working in groups with different tutors. We have individual one-on-one -on -one tutoring because again, everyone has a different way of interacting and understanding and working. Uh, sometimes they love to work in groups, sometimes they don't. So we have two hours of free individual tutoring on every course available to our students. So the, the instructor really lays out a plan for you at four weeks already, right? They'll identify the students who need more help. Then comes eight weeks. Eight weeks is when we are required to give a grade for every student in our class, along with comments if needed. Again, those are shared with you and your academic advisor and you go over that, student again doesn't see the grade, but the academic advisor does. And they can, they'll can they reach out to and say, okay, we need to have a conversation. We really need to make sure that we can turn this around for you if it's going bad. And uh, if you have not been able to make use of the resources, how I can change it. Sometimes 
there are extenuating circumstances. There are just reasons because of which a student is not able to engage with the course in a productive manner. Then we encourage our students to drop the course because at that point, it might be better than to continue and not pass. Right. And so there are many points in the course where you're given extensive feedback about how you're doing along with individual feedback on each and every assignment and exam. And then once you're done with the semester, there is an official grade that's put in to your, to your system and your transcripts. But what is visible to you is a pass or a fail or C minus and lower. But that doesn't mean at any point you are. Um, prohibited from looking at your grades is absolutely not the case. You have the full right to request your academic advisor to show you your grades for that semester. And all you have to do is either walk to your academic advisor or to your instructor and say, hey, can I just find out what is my overall grade? And they'll never say no. The idea is not to hide it from you. The idea is to de-emphasize the importance that we put on grades rather than really understanding how you are engaging with certain concepts. I don't know if that answers your question. I think we have time for one more question and you maybe already touched on this a little bit, but uh, what is it that you love about Reed? Like what uh, what motivates you to stay and to be a part of the community? Wow, I really like Reed. Well, okay, I love my job. And honestly, the strength of Reed is the, are the students. And it's really, it, uh, I have been, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I, um, I was in research for a decade before I started at Reed. So I completed my uh, graduate school, my PhD in 2009, long time ago. And after that, I was involved in pure research for many, many years, always wanted to somehow be involved in teaching, but just life happens, uh, one opportunity next to another. I also worked in industry for a couple of years, did a postdoctoral fellowship there because I wanted to just try what it's like to work in industry. But all along, I wanted to teach. And I had heard so much about Reed um, and the fact that they had such a strong emphasis on interdisciplinary research and just teaching and uh, education. I'm coming from India where at time when I was there, which was now 20 years ago, things have changed a lot. There was no concept of interdisciplinary research. And I got into physics because that was the field uh, accessible at that time, but I always wanted to do something that was physics, chemistry, and biology. I got to do it. I had a great time in grad school. I worked uh, at Genentech and I again continued in interdisciplinary research, but I really wanted to teach and have students working on these cutting edge technologies because I have come across those roadblocks every time in my career where you are trying to do something, but you have to already show your expertise before they will take you on, right? Even in grad school, the labs, they look for students who are coming with experience. But the whole idea I would ask my advisor is, we are supposed to teach them. We are not supposed to expect them to come with experience. And so it drives me that my students learn all that here at Reed. That's what's fantastic about it. They get exposed to incredible research techniques, skills that they develop along with a very strong curriculum. And I love that idea that we can train our students, we can work with them, that they drive our research. Without them, our research wouldn't exist. So I would say I love the fact that um, our students come motivated and that Reed puts in so much effort and resources into building such strong interdisciplinary education and research at the same time. That goes very much hand in hand. I'd offer a tremendous thank you to uh, Shivani for spending some time with us and kind of sharing more about some of the, the work and the work of students and the research that happens, the community that's built here. And want to offer a big thank you to you all for you know spending some time with us, getting to know more about Reed and the community. There'll be other opportunities to continue to get to know more about the great work of our faculty. And we have an office hours tomorrow in mathematics. We have one on Thursday in environmental studies, one on Thursday as well in Humanities 110, which I know we touched on a little bit here today. But uh, feel free to please reach out to us with any questions. I know we're always happy to help in the admissions office side of things. But I want to thank you all for joining and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.